Hairdo Uncut Podcast. On a special episode of the Hairdo Uncut Podcast, I interview Justin Lumen, hairstylist out in Palo Alto, California. We talk a lot about uh, his history, uh, what got him into hair. We also talk about uh, things that clients should look for in a stylist and important things for stylists to remember about clients coming into their salon. And we talk a little bit about hair care in the different states that he has worked in. A lot of great insight, a lot of great perspective. Hope you enjoy. Justin, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And those of you who don't know, uh, Justin actually used to be a uh, stylist here at Hairdo, and we'll we'll go into kind of his his past and where he's at now. But uh, I figured he would be a great uh, option for a guinea pig for the first interview. So Justin, I appreciate you joining. Thanks, Paulson. Hey, hey how, and actually, how do you uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Is it Lumen? Yeah, exactly. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I know that on your Instagram it says Powell, and I'm like Lumen. I'm like, oh, I hope I don't butcher this. So, um, so just uh, I want to just take a few minutes for Justin to introduce yourself, um, and you know, kind of just go down. You know, how long have you been doing hair? Uh, I've been doing hair counting school 22 years. Oh wow, 22, yeah. which means you're only 23. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so what what made you what made you go into hair? Uh, kind of a funny story. I was studying to be an opera singer and um, was still in high school at the time. Really? Did a lot of stuff with the Utah Festival uh, Opera Company, but I wasn't a, a member. I just did a lot of stuff that they wanted me to. I was, did a lot of ushering for the Ellen Eccles Theater in Logan, Utah. Sure. And my dad and I were um, clearing brush in a in a new lot where we were building a new home. And he's. I was driving a backhoe clearing this lot and we we're burning a bunch of this stuff and we stop and we start having a conversation and he says, you know, you're pretty good at the singing thing, but you're also six foot three. And at the time, the most well-known soprano in the world was Sarah Brightman. Okay. And he says, you know, she's like four eleven, five foot, maybe the chances of you getting cast with her, even if you're the best in the world, are pretty slim because it's going to look like Mutt and Jeff up there. <laughs> so what else do you want to do? And I thought about it, and I'd always been interested in doing hair, but I didn't know that was going to be my career. Sure. Um, so I started beauty school. I went to New Horizons in Logan, Utah, and that changed my life. Oh, I didn't. I actually didn't know that you had grown up in Utah. Yeah, I grew up in Logan, Utah. Interesting. It's an, it's an amazing place. Um, I was a kid for a long time. I didn't know about things about the world until after 18 years old. And, sure. uh, that's something to speak of these days. Awesome. So what was, what, what was, so you, you've got that as like you, you decided to go in. So what's your inspiration for doing hair and what continues to be your inspiration to continue doing hair? You know, the thing about this industry is that it is always changing. It's always different. Yes. There's always something new. There's, um, the the connection that you get with clients that become your lifers, if you will, the um, you go through everything with them. You know, their divorces, their marriages, their deaths, their kids graduating high school, everything. You go through that with these people, and they see you every two to six to eight weeks sometimes. So you're always in their lives. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of a privilege. It's kind of a cool thing to be part of. No, I totally, I totally agree. I um. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good, uh, drive. And I think, I think, uh, hair is you, you were talking about how everything's always changing in hair. I was like, you know, I sometimes tell people now and, and joke, I'm like, you know, if you have ADD hair is the perfect job for you. Mm -hmm. You got, you got a different person in your chair and you've got something different in the hair every day. And it just is a fuel that it's, it's, even though it's the same people, sometimes it's a change and then you get a new person in and it just kind of fuels you to continue going. So I was, I was joking about that. Yeah, there's a, a thing about the ADD you mentioned. Um, it's not been diagnosed, but people say that I have a bit of that. Um, oh. And so I think it is a good job for me. Another I'm sure we is, all have a little bit of it. Yeah, uh, the <laughs> dyslexia is actually kind of an interesting thing because I deal with some of that too. Um, I memorize things well, and I memorize and I remember everything I memorize. Which but, is good for color especially. Exactly. Color, uh, different shapes for haircuts. Um yeah you know, that kind of stuff. So it makes it easier for me to do this job and do it well. 
Well, that, well, that's 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 awesome. So what? So you're talking about hair. Um, what what would you say your specialties are? I mean, do you go do you go start to finish? Are there some services you don't do, or some services that you prefer, or you're really well known for? I started my career as a colorist in Honolulu, and um, uh, by chance, actually, and um, then I evolved into going back to doing everything. Uh, I worked with a really nasty, mean Korean woman who I love to death, uh, who taught me. <laughs> A bit about business when I was her apprentice and for the most part when I was in an apprentice assistant position I worked with a colorist who had been doing color for 30 years at that point she just retired after like 55 years this wow. woman knows everything about hair color <laughs> so um, uh, the evolution just kind of came it was I was a colorist first and that's where I that's what I loved and that's what I enjoyed doing the most okay not the same today, but I do everything now. Okay. I was about to say, do you kind of try to stick to a color client base and then uh, just, you know, end up having cuts because people are just like, well, I'm here, let me give a cut? Or, you know, do you kind of make sure you you stay up on everything from do you want cuts to, and colors? Do you, do you want to hear exactly how that went, how I yes. started here again? Okay. Yeah. So in Honolulu, um, uh, I worked as a colorist for four years at the beginning of my career. And I decided that I needed to leave the salon I was working at because my grandfather was sick and I also um, needed more time. And um, then later came an opportunity for me to uh, educate for a manufacturer statewide. And that was fun. Um, and I had to rent a chair in order to do this. Yeah. And I went to work with two uh, stylists that had opened up a small salon in Honolulu that I'd worked with at the previous place. And Joanne, who taught me how to cut hair, basically, because I didn't learn how to cut hair in school. They did their best, but they just got me to a place where I could pass the test. I, I think that's it, I think that's that I think that's how all schools are even nowadays. Yeah. That, and that's pretty standard in the in industry. And I mentioned uh, uh, Gina, the uh, woman I worked with as her assistant. She used to tell me all the time, you have to be good at everything or you never make any money in this industry. And I said, what? You're nuts. I'm going to be a colorist, so on and so forth. So fast forward to going to rent a chair, working with the manufacturer. I am sitting there with Joanne, and she says to me, Justin, you are letting money walk out the door. And I said, what are you talking about? You're just doing their color. They're getting their hair cut somewhere else, and they're probably going back to the old salon. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay. She says, I taught you, amongst others, to cut hair. Now, it's important as a colorist to be able to cut hair because you need to know placement and so on and so forth. Sure. She says to me, I have a suggestion. Why don't you start cutting hair? Do some of the clients that have easier haircuts to do so that you can collect that money as well. Oh, that's good. So then I hear money and I'm like, yes. So <laughs> um, I, it became one of those things where I was like, okay, you know, she's kind of right. Let's do this. And I love doing blow dries uh, styles. So it's kind of a natural fit because you, you cutting hair, you finish the blow, you know, and also um, <clears throat> I started doing perms again because Gina, that Korean lady, she used to test uh, perms for a manufacturer that we all worked for back in that four years. Sure. And so she taught me how to do them. And I was like, well, okay, that's money too going out the door. So um, I do, I do them now and I did them back then. They're not my favorite thing to do, but people pay me money to do it and I do it well. So, um, I think it's important to be versed in a lot of different things. And as a, as a hairdresser, when you say, I don't do this or I don't do that, you're limiting yourself, you're limiting your growth, you're limiting all kinds of things. Now, I don't do extensions, and there's a reason why. Because there's other people out there that do them a lot better than I do. Yeah. However, in the current situation, it's something that I need to learn how to do because money's going out the door and nobody else wants to do it. So I'm going to do it. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that's that's cool. You know, it, it's interesting because a lot of I, I feel like a lot of stylists now, um, mm -hmm. you know, they want to be really good in one thing because, you know, mm -hmm. with, with Instagram now, it's just like, oh, they're good at blonde. They're good at short haircuts. So I'm just going to go there and they're like, well, this is how I'm going to do it. I, but for me, I was like I, I, I was always thinking like that'd be boring to just do the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. Like if you were just doing only blonde hair all day long or you were just doing like a long layered cut all day long, like after a while you're like, this is really, really boring. So I, I would assume that you would want to 
branch out and do other things so that you're able to, you know, have some variety in your life. Cause right. well, variety the, is the spice of life. Yeah. Well, and, and it, and it is, but the thing about that, you know, I specialize in this or I only do this or I only do that. That's something that is, I think has to do with marketing, yeah. but it also isn't taking into account what the clients like and what they need. Sure. And there's a lot of salons out there that are specialized, meaning they, you do this or that. And that works for them. And a lot of people enjoy that. And a lot of people don't. Yeah. And my experience and my clientele and everybody I've been around for many years, they didn't want to go to two different people to get their cut and color done. Right. You know, they, they wanted to be in the same chair and they didn't want to, it, it, it was more complicated. And um, so there's two different schools of thought. There's that thought like Sassoon, what they do is they have specialized, right? That's what they've always done. Yes. And any place I've ever worked, for the most part, except for in the beginning of my career, it was, you do everything. Um, and I do like the variety. I mean, I'm not doing a lot of perms, but I get to do them. And when I do them, they're kind of fun because I don't do them all the time. <laughs> yeah. So. You, you'd be hard pressed to convince anybody at hairdo other than like two stylists to do a perm. <laughs> I remember talking about that because there's that one client that used to come in on Saturdays that would get a spiral perm. Everybody knows who she is and she's fantastic. Um, but I would always do a spiral perm on her about every t three months or so. Yeah. It was a long drawn out thing, but she was so appreciative because in the past everybody told her she couldn't have a perm and it fulfilled a need for her because yeah able to do it for her yeah <laughs> now you've moved around a lot i didn't know you went to school but you said you started your career in hawaii so how i how long were you did you just like graduate school in utah and then head out to hawaii like right after or was there like a time where you were like assisting or or working at a salon before you moved out to hawaii we'll go with the first one where <laughs> i graduated high school went to beauty school and then took off and moved to hawaii oh okay i started my career there all right. And then you've got you, then you, then I'm assuming, I'm pretty sure you just moved to Arizona and then you moved out to California where you're at now, correct? Yeah. We moved, I moved to Arizona in um, 2006 and um, we moved to California in 2014. I will share this with you. Uh, Arizona is where my career changed. My whole existence in this industry changed for the better. Um, really? and I've encountered some people here in the Bay area who have some really beautiful salons and are very well known. But the thing about Arizona that I find is interesting and the same goes for Hawaii. People in Arizona and Hawaii that are stylists that care about the industry, they invest so much into their skill, their craft. The education is incredible yes. and the technical skills in Arizona and Honolulu are by far better than some of the stuff I've seen in California. Interesting. There's some really great, there's some really great hairdressers here, but um, consistency wise, Honolulu and Arizona, Phoenix metro area, they have got some incredible hairdressers working there. Well, what do you, why do you think, why do you think that? Cause that's, that's really interesting. And for me, the, from being outside, so I didn't grow up in the hair industry, as I've told uh, those right. who listen to the podcast, all 15 of them so far, <laughs> right. but um you know, what I've said is, you know, I didn't grow up in it. So I, I was like blind to this and, and now being in the industry for now, like seven years and like just seeing yeah. how different States are. My only thing is, is like, yeah, I mean, yes, there's money out in Hawaii and obviously there's money here in Arizona, but it's mm -hmm. like, I feel like stylists would probably as a theory would probably have to work harder to be better, to hold on to clients rather than California where, you know, up in San Francisco where kind of where you're at, there's just mm -hmm. gobs of money floating around. And then down in LA, kind of the same thing, just tons of money floating around and the, uh, necessity of being a fantastic stylist. It's almost a status to go to this, what particular salon or stylist, whether they're super good or not. And it's, you know, there's not as much pressure as say Hawaii, Arizona, or maybe some other States where you've got to be good to hold on to your clients. I, I mean, would you, would uh, you agree would, with that or, or what, what would, what would be your opinion on why that, that may be? I would agree with that. Um, the Bay Area is very good at marketing things and um, getting things out there to the public. Uh, the um, Any kind of tech thing that comes out that comes from here that is successful, they've got some marketing people behind them. Now, I've heard 
here, and I believe it because I've experienced a couple of these stylists um, interacting with them. Um, there, like in LA, for example, there is a hype with being a celebrity hairdresser, hairstylist, and you see this on Instagram all the time and other social media sites where a stylist is posting a picture of a famous person or vice versa or you know so something like that. Sure. I found out that a lot of these stylists, you know what they do is they have agents and the agents introduce them to the clientele. And if it works, then it's great. And if it doesn't, then it's not. Now, I think that's great. I think maybe I should get an agent, but <laughs> um, that's one way. And I don't know if everybody does it, but that's one way that they build their base and build the hype, um, uh, which is very interesting because in Arizona and Honolulu, I never thought of doing anything like that. Yeah. You know, it's a totally different world out here in California. And I, I don't want to be misunderstood. There's some really amazing hairdressers here. For sure, um, for sure. And I've worked with some that are just incredible. But the hairdressers in Phoenix and the hairdressers in Honolulu, guess what, guys? They're pretty freaking amazing. Well, you know what's you know what's interesting, though, is it, it's funny is like the, the few that are out here, because one of the things that Suzanne has noticed is that it's it's harder, like all the good education is out on the coasts, New York, yeah. uh, LA. So all these talented stylists that are technically skilled and, and do a good job uh, mm -hmm. educating, they're all on the coast. So then everybody in the middle is kind of like, they've got to go to one coast or another to get mm -hmm. the good education. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then you've got the ones here in Arizona who put forth a lot of effort, you know, they, they put, they invest themselves in, in, in that money and trying to trying to do that but they've got to you know that it becomes super expensive and it'd be so much yeah. better if you could have more educators really coming in to give quality not just like you know hey i'm really good at cutting hair and you guys are going to watch me cut it and then leave like it would be so beneficial for all these stylists that are struggling from a skill standpoint to have somebody close by a little bit more closer and local than spending yeah. you know two thousand dollars to go have somebody in la do it yeah so, now there. There is a lot of uh, uh, those uh, educators that are um, really great that are, do live on the coasts. But then I've met one, for example, that worked for an Italian brand that lives in Sun Valley, Idaho, and they fly him into places to teach. Yeah. And I met is, lives in Reno. Um, so I think that there is the base of them that are on the coast, but then you also have them that are, you know, they go to the coast to teach the class to people that are coming from Arizona or Honolulu, if, if you get what I mean. Yeah. So. Um, I always wanted more education in Arizona and Honolulu was different because it's so far away, you know, and, um, I think that may be why there's such a strong technical, uh, um, group in, Ho in Honolulu because they have to be, otherwise they don't, it doesn't come there. So, um, that's an interesting thing. I never really thought of it like that. Most hairdressers, they get excited about going on a trip to see a show. Um, or see a, a presentation. Um, sure. So, anyway. well, no, and I, and, and, and obviously it is, but I'm like from a, you know, from a lot of, from like a money standpoint, you know, they, they mm -hmm. charge, you know, a thousand dollars to come out just for that. And then you're like yeah. hotel and food, mm -hmm. you know, and, and playing around maybe I'm like, you know, that's, that's a large investment, but it is, you know, it'd be so much easier to get that, that good technical work done closer mm -hmm. to home and then go to a mm -hmm. show for maybe a little bit more inspiration and, and, and whatnot. Yeah. But I would um, say that has a lot to do with the manufacturers and their education systems because sure. uh, that's where we get a lot of it from. Um, uh, and it's more about what they need or what they deem important or what their, their needs are yeah. as far as getting the information out there. Yeah. So, a, Oh, go ahead. That's a very interesting thing that we're talking about here because I mean, if you think about it, if everybody has to go to the coast, but only half the people do, then what's left in the middle, you know? And why wouldn't manufacturers want to have more representation in the middle? Well, not only more representation, but if if their brand, you know, because you've got you've got edu you've got private educators who I think mm -hmm. do a little bit more of a a focused uh, skill based education mm -hmm. versus you know, because I've seen a lot of salons post like, oh hey, you know, we're getting education, but it's really just the presenter doing the haircut and showing yeah. people, and I'm like, well, this is. You don't go to basketball practice to watch people play basketball. Like you've got mm -hmm. to take the ball, you got to dribble. Like it's a skill, and I think that's where a lot—not every manufacturer, but I know that a lot of manufacturers who pr provide that education for salons—that's where mm -hmm. they're missing. You know, since we're talking about this, I want to point something out. 
Um, when I was young and coming up in the industry, uh, we paid for tickets to go to shows or classes or whatever, like you're talking about. Um, there was an educator there. We paid a lot of money for this stuff, right? We had to go to it, and it was usually on a day off. I have noticed, because I've been doing some research on this, um, uh, there's a lot of really good hairdressers coming out of school, like right out of school. Yes. And they started getting their skill set before they even started school. Yeah. And it's because they have access to something that I didn't have access to at that age. Right. YouTube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... So that's one thing that, you know, maybe maybe there isn't anything in the middle because there's access to information like that. YouTube, Instagram. I watched a video the other day of a, a, a hairdresser in L.A. doing a technique. And I was like, oh, yeah, I have done that before, but I forgot about it. Yeah. And it's going to fulfill a need for somebody up here that, you know, wants a certain look. And uh, and I sat there and watched the whole thing on Instagram. I think it took an hour out of my day. So. <laughs> So I'm glad I got the information. I was reminded about this, but it's just there at your fingertips. Yeah. Yeah. No. And so, and, and it's, and just for those who are clients who are listening, who are listening to this, um, you know, it's just really important to find a stylist that, you know, has gotten uh, uh, some really good education uh, when you, when you're doing your research, as we've talked about in a couple episodes in the past, uh, w Justin, what, um, cause I want to transition to a few things for, for clients really to, uh, to kind of glom onto, uh, mm -hmm. what do you think is the biggest barrier for stylists and clients to hurdle early in a professional hair relationship before they like really connect? Like what, what do you think are some big hurdles? Well, I think just, um, the number one thing is, you know, are they going to get along? You know, cause you meet, meet somebody and you're going to either get along with them or not. Yeah. You, you know, most of the time I think people get along with each other, but you know, I have blonde hair on the top of my head. Maybe the style or the client that came in doesn't like it. You sure. know, she doesn't like the way it looks. Um, uh, I think, uh, it does take some time for that relationship to establish itself and be solidified if you will. Um, and, uh, I don't know what really is the kicker as far as whether it's going to work or not. But as I mentioned before, you are building a relationship with this person. Now, the first time I do somebody's hair that's new in my chair, I tend to be a little cautious with the option of we can adjust it later if it's not working. Sure. Because now old school thought is that if it doesn't work, they never come back or they complain or they write something on Yelp. Uh, and I try to be very transparent and let them know that, you know, we've just started working together. So we've got to get somewhere first. And then once we've established, I guess it's trust, really. You establish trust For with sure. that person and you um, you go forward from there or not. Um, well, and you point I, out something you point out. So sorry to cut you off, but you point uh -huh. out something that's really, really important that I think gets lost in for, for a lot of stylists right now is their lack of communication. It's something that I've noticed from like a from general, even from from uh, stylists who've been doing hair for a long time to young stylists. So it's not just, you know, it's not just in the quote unquote millennial stylist, right. but I've noticed tons where they just don't sit down and have a, a thorough consultation and are, are upfront and honest and um, communicate very well with the client. And those are super important things that I think that you just right. pointed out that clients should should see when a, when they sit down in a chair They'll uh -huh. know if that if that stylist is going to take a few minutes with them and go over things with them like that sets them apart from any mm -hmm. other stylist. And they should they should feel really comfortable with the stylist going forward from that just from that mm -hmm. point. Now, there's two questions that I ask clients in, in a consultation because we go through the whole thing about, you know, tone and length and, you know, shade, whatever. And the two most important things that I in my experience that I've that I've learned to ask is what is the, when was your hair your favorite? When did you like your hair the best? Do you have That's a picture? A question. Is there something you can show me? Then the second question is, what don't you like about your hair or what has been done to your hair that you just absolutely hated that puts you in my chair today? Yes. Uh, because those are the two most important things about a consultation. And it can be about how you present it or how you ask the question, but I mean, that's a pretty simple question to ask. And then you get a lot of information when you ask those two questions. I normally ask what they don't like first, and then I ask what they do like second and ask for pictures, and then go back to what you don't like. And it's interesting when you go back the second time and ask that question because other stuff comes up. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, that's one thing that I do. Yeah. That I think 
You know, and, and and you were talking about how it's it's the start of a relationship, and I think that's a really good thing that stylists should kind of say up front to to clients because you know now we we live in the we live in this world of Instagram and Facebook and social media and stuff where it's like clients are walking in and they're expecting to be amazed and wowed their very yeah. first time, right? And you know. Suzanne was, I was talking to Suzanne. I've heard other stylists say this. They, she was like, you know, even for a skilled stylist like myself, mm -hmm. she, it, it still takes two or three times for us yep. to really get in a good step, um, from a personal standpoint. I mean, you, you're obvious they're, they're, they're the obvious, like, this is not going to work and this is love at first sight. Right. But a majority I would, I would consider clients to be in the gray area of, you know, mm -hmm. it just takes a few times to, to really get used to each other, but also for the stylist to get used to your hair, you know, yeah. they're looking at it for the first time and trying mm -hmm. to make the best. And there's a lot of stylists that do a really good job. And I'm not saying that stylists will mess up the first time, but for it to get a real good roof. So would you agree with like a three times it takes it or, or maybe a yeah. little bit less, maybe I a little think, bit more. I think it depends on the situation, but I would say three is a good middle number. It could take four, it could take five. Yeah. I have a client right now. Um, we she wanted a highlight last time she was in, and we did a keratin treatment on her also. Now she doesn't want to be too blonde, so I decided to go ahead and put a low light in that matched her natural color as I was doing the highlight. She asked me what was in the other bowl as I was about to be finished, and I told her what it was, and she said, Well, we didn't agree on that. Now, I had done her hair probably three times before that, and she was so thrilled with the haircut I gave her yeah. all the times that I did it. Now, the interesting thing is because I did not communicate that with her, I almost lost her as a client. Yeah. So yesterday she booked for her next appointment, which I went, hallelujah. Yeah. But at 22 years, I'm still learning myself that in that instance, I did not communicate with her well because clients are also more educated. They know what's happening behind the no, chair. That's totally true. So... Or at least they have access to it. Some are really, really well educated if they want to be. And then some just mm -hmm. still, are, you know, we still have a ton of people sit down and they show us a picture of a celebrity's ombre and they're like, I want this. And we're like, uh, you, you're not going to be able to get there. And just so you know, it takes, you know, four or five hours to get you there. And they're like, what? So, <laughs> well, I try to be pretty transparent. I'm like, well, that look took about mm, eight hours and yeah. it was in two sessions. And there was all these extra charges because they had to use this product and that product yes. to get you there. And then they go out and get it done somewhere else where it may not explain that. And then they come back to you and it's a mess. Yes. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I think clients, I, I don't know where they get the idea that it's going to be so fast. Um, but, uh, I have an easy time explaining why it isn't fast. Uh, some do not. And I try to help those that do not how to do not know how to express that, get it across to the client so that the client doesn't freak out and say, yes, OK, let's do it your way because it's the right way. Or I'm right. going to go down the road and have Susie do it. You know, it's it's just about communication, really. No, it is. And and it's something that we've been pushing the last few years for with our stylists is just look, you know, give them ranges, give them up front, tell them mm -hmm. how long it's going to take. You know, if, mm -hmm. if it's a younger person that mom or dad or mom or dad are going to be flipping the bill, like make sure mom mm -hmm. is either texted or present for the consultation, yeah. you know, so it's yeah. just super important. And that's where I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of stylists are falling short is just in that communication base. Yeah. Just like you said, you have been doing hair for a long time and you just missed one little section of communication and could have uh -huh. almost lost a client. Like it's yeah. just, and, and it's just this constant fight for clients and stylists to just work together to have the hair that the client wants. And, and, right. and clients just need to realize a majority of stylists want you to be completely happy. One from a selfish region so that you're back in the chair, <laughs> you know, you know, yep. paying for your guys is helping pay for your livelihood. And mm -hmm. two, it's pride in their work. Like they want they you leaving, whether you come back or not, you leaving with good hair makes them, you know, feel good about what they're doing as a job versus if they just right. do a terrible job and you leave feeling terrible. Like if a stylist ever knew that somebody felt terrible about their hair, most stylists I know would feel, you know, kind of bummed that they didn't make the stylist happy. So, or yeah. the client happy. So, yeah. Uh, whenever I have something like that happen to me, it's almost like it, I don't want to be so dramatic, but it's almost like it hurts to my core. Like I'm so disappointed that <laughs> it's it, because I guess I spend so much time and effort in what I'm doing and educating myself. And, you know, I know the back end of the business really well too. And, and when somebody's not happy, it's like, 
okay, remind yourself, you can't make everybody happy, Justin. Yeah. You know, and also maybe it was just an off day. And if they come back, they give you another try, then great. If not, then, you know, you just take a loss and you move on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't sure. think clients always understand. See, I am a little more uh, open with my clients about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it yeah. because I want them to understand that this this package, this product, this manufacturer has done all this testing on this thing and this is why it works because it says to do it this way. And 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 I think that's where a lot of breakdown happens also is because people go to one hairdresser that cheats and and you know skirts the rules and then there's somebody like me who believes the manufacturer did all this testing for a reason. Yes. Better to follow those guidelines than to just go willy-nilly and say, I'm going to do it my way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that works, but not all the time. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. So what are a couple things that you wish clients knew walking into a, a styles chair or your own personal chair? You know, what are a couple things that you wish that they knew for, you know, going into a, an appointment for the first time? Um, the, uh, the, uh, an appointment for the first time. Okay, so this is kind of a big thing for me because I am a, I, I, I'm kind of OCD about being, no, I don't, I'm not, I'm not OCD. I just like to be on time, right? Sure. Yeah. Or a little early if, if I can be. But when you get a new client or a regular client or whoever that comes in and you're running 30 minutes behind because of n nothing to do with anything you can control, we have bad days. We have days where things just don't go right. Just like doctors not, and any other business. Yeah, yeah. We're not doing it on purpose. We're not trying to take up more of your time. In fact, we might hide it well, but we are more stressed out that we are behind for whatever reason. For sure. And most times, honestly, it is actually because something went wrong during the day. An example, I was staying in Santa Cruz last week. I was on my way to the train station to get to Palo Alto and I was an hour late because traffic was so bad and that was just to get me to the train station. Once I got on the train, everything was fine, but yeah. that was completely out of my hands. And I didn't do it on purpose. It's not like I was out partying the night before. Most of us take this very seriously because it's our career. It's our livelihood. Yeah. But sometimes happen. Now, if somebody's running 10 minutes behind, it's kind of not a big deal. I mean, you go anywhere and somebody's going to be running behind. I guess the big thing that I want people to say is, or to hear is our clients, especially, we don't always do this on purpose. We're not trying to ruin your day. It just so happens that this happened or that happened. Now, if a client shows up late, they have circumstances, too, that have led to that. We, for the most part in the industry, are understanding of that because if we don't do the hair, then we're not going to get paid. Right. But there also has to be a limit because it's going to push back the rest of the day. Especially if you're habitually late. <laughs> yes. And we a lot time for certain services, and most of us have it figured out how long that's going to take so that we can give you the right amount of time and the correct amount of time. And if you're already 15 minutes late and so say you're going to be another 15 for a 45 minute appointment, that's not fair to the client because I'm not going to be able to give them that 45 minute service in 15 minutes. Sure. Yep. And that's where a lot of breakdown or a misunderstanding comes in because they think that we're just outside having coffee and talking stories and we're not, you know, we're rushing around trying to get everything done. Um, yep. so anyway, that's my thing on that. Well, and I think it's important for, for clients also to go in and see, you know, and, and especially from a well-run salon standpoint, mm -hmm. like if that person shows up an hour late and has no idea, I think that's where a big portion of the breakdown happens. But it's like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, whether you're a renter or you're, you're working as an employee at a salon, like the salon mm -hmm. or yourself should be like, Hey, look, this is what's happening. And you know, got to, got to readjust your day a little bit. I, I think that's where that, that's where people, you know, you want to tell people ahead of time, because if, mm -hmm. if they realize it, you know, if you tell somebody two hours behind, Hey, look, tons of traffic, I'm going to be an hour behind, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. everybody can make adjustments to their, to yeah. their day or reschedule or something like that. You've saved the relationship. It may not save your day. You know, if somebody's like, Hey, that's really not going to work, it may not save your day, but it'll save the client in the future and that relationship, yeah. you know? So, That's, yeah, I think, I think it's just really important. Like we just go back to what we were talking about. Communication is just so important. And a lot, I I find just a lot of stylists just don't, just don't do that. You know, they'll, they'll tell, you know, they'll wait for them to get there. And that's when the client gets mad. Like you're 40 minutes behind and you couldn't mm -hmm. have somebody call You couldn't have an assistant it's, or the front desk call me, you know, it's actually interesting. You bring that up because I, I want to touch on this just for a minute. Now, 
and there's a lot of salons that I've been in and a lot of places I've seen that it's a, all about the individual as a, um, a person behind the chair. It's their thing. It's their chair. It's their, whether yes. they're commissioned or not, uh, that seems to be the attitude that's brought up, uh, they're brought up in. Now I've been fortunate to work in two places and I'm trying to work on the third, um, <laughs> where it is a more team approach where, everybody helps each other out. Like receptionists, for example, they'll notice that a stylist is running behind and they will actually go and ask the stylist or um, another stylist will see that they're running behind or an assistant and offer to help. Yes. That is something that's very foreign in our industry. And I helped create that situation in one place. I saw it at Hairdo. And then we are trying to do that now where I'm at currently. Um, there was a day I didn't have anything on my schedule a few months ago and another stylist was booked back to back, like on the half hour or 45. So she didn't have help that day. And I said, you know what, I'm not doing anything. I'll help you. If I get booked with something, then I won't. But for the most part, I'll be right by your side. And I'm a master stylist. That's my title. I have been a color educator for a manufacturer. I could go on and on about my experience. I have a lot. But this is where I think the big breakdown comes with stylists. Totally. And I think Clients notice this when this happens because these clients that were sitting in her chair that day that I helped her, they all recognize me. They know me. They feel comfortable with me. I assisted her all day long. But it was kind of cool to go back to that because I haven't been an assistant for a very long time. Yeah. But I remembered everything. So what that means is that we created this team environment where everybody can help each other out. If I go on vacation for two weeks, so-and-so can get their color done with so-and-so. It's not going to be exactly the same, but it'll be similar, and they're going to come back to me. Um, because they, there is that relationship, there's that loyalty to that one person. No, that's awesome. It's, it's so much more relaxing and inviting when a client comes in and says hi to everybody that works there because they know everybody. Yep. You know, or and everybody get it's it's a happier place, really. And, no, for uh, bro, for both clients and for because for clients and for stylists, you know, you know, with our with our transition at Hairdo as like a team based mm -hmm. salon and really kind of focus, like all the stylists here who have stayed like mm -hmm. really recognize how it's not only beneficial for them because a lot of them get a lot of help when they're behind we can yep. throw somebody you know somebody can run over there and there's not this like well it doesn't financially benefit me and the fact that you did that like mm -hmm. i mean that's that's an amazing thing justin for, yeah, for real it's, a, it's a, it, it financially benefiting you but how good can it make you feel to help your neighbor out you know the people in these yes. days are so about themselves and so busy and everything's going on. If you take a minute to help somebody out or they take a minute to help you out, everybody in the room feels so much better. And if that vibration is going through the place, then things are going to be better all around. Absolutely. People. And, and it's just so much happier. <laughs> Yes. And, and like you were kind of pointing out for clients, like if you're going on vacation for two weeks, mm -hmm. you suggesting somebody that you trust and that, you know, mm -hmm. is so much better than them being like, well, now I've either got to have terrible roots or, or whatever, yeah. you know, for for two extra, three extra weeks versus mm -hmm. getting it done from somebody that that he trusts or going to Facebook and, right. you know, being like, hey, does anybody have a stylist? They know mine's on vacation. And then they get right. 40 stylists and have to close their eyes and point and be like, OK, I'm going to go with that one because she's a good friend of mine. And then they go, they get it messed up. You come back and yeah. you're like, what the heck? Where did you go? Or they go yeah, or did. they do what's worse and go to Target or uh, Walgreens and buy box code. And they're like, oh, this will be fine. And then you come in, you're like, yeah. oh. Well, I'll, I'll share this with you. My experience with salon owners is that they don't always like to tell the truth. They don't need to tell the whole truth about why a stylist isn't in on a day or why they're on vacation or where they are. And I think that's doing a disservice to the client. Like I said, they don't need to tell them everything. And the clients probably don't really even want to know everything. But they need to know something and they should yes. know the truth because client uh, salon owners are so fearful that they're going to lose a client if they find out that so-and-so called out sick. Well, if they are actually sick, then they're sick. What good are they going to do everybody there when they're going to be passing around the flu? And no, whatever? totally, totally. And, and you know what? I, I, for the most part, even though it's an inconvenience on clients, I'm like, I don't mm -hmm. think you want somebody sick touching all up in your scare, yeah. skin and hair yeah. and then you getting sick. Yeah. And for the clients, I've come back from um, being sick for 10 days. And the stories I heard about what they were told while I was out, it was like, well, why would they tell you that? Because I'm not 
this is not making this up. I thought I was going to have to have surgery and I didn't end up having to do that. And, yes. and my doctor in Arizona was great and he got it taken care of. But it's like for 10 days I've been sick and you're telling my clients this and that. And that's not actually what happened. It makes me seem like I'm irresponsible. <laughs> Wait, so you were at another salon in Arizona no, other than yeah, Hurdu? Yeah, not Hurdu. Okay. Disclaimer, not Hurdu, <laughs> but it was another place. And um, if anybody wants to know, I'll tell them. But it was just like you're putting up a show, a facade. People don't want that. They want honesty. They no, want to totally. know what's going on. Um, yep. And when you, they get the truth, they're actually a little bit more compassionate and understanding when they can't have that appointment. No, I, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you on that. That's, it's super important. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, so I want to talk a little bit about hair because and one of the reasons yeah. why I think you're an interesting, you're an interesting interview for right now is that you've lived in, you know, you've done hair in three different states. We'll call it three, even though it's technically been four, but we'll talk yeah. about three because I think the climates between Hawaii, Arizona, and California are yeah. so much different. So like even from a, so what differences do you notice um, not only from, we'll talk about hair care first. I'll, I'll try to break yeah. this down for hair care. So like, what are the differences that you've noticed between the three states? So you don't have to go like super long into every single mm -hmm. one, but like, okay. let, let's take, for example, like if, if, if a blonde client comes in, in mm -hmm. Hawaii versus Arizona mm -hmm. versus San Francisco, how, how is your approach different, um, in, in talking with that style, with that client who has blonde hair? Well, it depends on their, uh, I'd say, ethnicity, for what sure, they're made sure. up of, because Hawaii is a melting pot. California has a lot of different um, groups here, if you will. And yes. Arizona is a little bit more, I'd say, like me, um, <laughs> where <laughs> where there is some ethnicity running around, but every, there's a lot of blondes there, we'll say that. Yes. Um, in Hawaii, we didn't do a lot of blondes like we did in Arizona, and we do less of them in California than we did in Arizona. Interesting. Um, I figured uh, the blonde was coming from California. Uh, no. Uh, well, <laughs> sometimes yes and sometimes no. It's, California is so diverse in its population that um, we do a lot. Let me just say it this way. When I moved to Arizona and started doing hair there, I basically had to sort well, sort of relearn how to do hair because I had been working with all these different textures in Hawaii, and I was so fast with that. And then I come here or come to Arizona, and it was so – different because it was the texture of hair was different it was yes. finer hair, blonder hair um but that's cool because i can deal with all of it and then coming to california it's very interesting because there is um kind of a mix of the both you know yeah uh, uh as far as products go that's kind of an evolution um i i'm unfortunately kind of been brand focused if you will um, so I worked for Paul Brown of Hawaii uh, at first, and he had his own product line, and that's what we used and we sold. And uh, we had a color line that we stuck with for a while that was great. It was a German color line. And then I go to work for the manufacturer, and I'm renting a chair using those products, and that's all I used. And then I moved to Arizona, and I was working at one salon, and we had two or three different brands, and that's all I really used or ever cared about. Now, most of these organizations that I worked for, they brought education from the manufacturers to us. Yeah. As a group, now and, and at Hairdo, I got to uh, get back into another line that at the salon I'm at now, I was able to encourage them to bring it in because it helps with our demographic, if you will. Somebody's looking for this particular brand, and now we have it. Wait, which brand is that? A Bumble and Bumble. Oh, so you guys are a Bumble salon? We're not a Bumble salon specifically. We have Bumble and Bumble, Orbe, Kerastas, and Arroyo. Gotcha. Um, and a little bit of R and Co. Um, but the uh, the thing with the Bumble and Bumble is we were looking to expand our reach, so to speak. Yeah. Bumble, Bumble, the price point is great. Uh, Orbe is a little bit more expensive. Kerastase is a little bit more expensive. And um, so we needed something that was a little more easy to obtain, if you will. doesn't mean it's not any good because it's actually really amazing. Yeah. Uh, um, but the products that I've used in my career over the years have evolved and changed and the technology is incredible. Yes. Some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, and it's really hard to find one line that you just love, right? It's, it, like, it's getting it's getting harder and harder. Um, I, I, but I only see a few, you know, one thing that I pointed out to a lot of people is like there's, there's a few that are 
you know, setting trends versus mm-hmm. following, you know, like I would say, I would say Paul Mitchell and Bumble and Bumble. And I, I'm not familiar with every line. Um, I would right. put Oribe up there with, you yeah. know, they're doing a lot of research into the products and, and really trying to roll out things that people are starting to do to their hair. You know, they're, yeah. they're watching trends with hair mm-hmm. color and trying to, uh, uh, widen out and, and, and increase, you know, their, their usability basically. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, I'm sure there's a couple others that are doing a really good job, but yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. There there's, there's, there's a lot of good products and it's hard to nail them down. We've cut back a ton, you know, yeah. we've got Bumble and Bumble, Paul Mitchell, but we only have like a couple other brands and we only have carry pieces, a couple products, a couple products of those brands. We've mm-hmm. cut it back way back from when you were here. Yeah. Yeah. Bumble so, and Bumble. They're great because they're education focused, um, and, and they, they the products all have a purpose, an actual purpose that's more specific than some of the other brands out there. Yeah, and that's what I love about them. Um, I will say my top, I would my favorite product of all time, oddly, is um, the Surf Foam Spray, <laughs> because I do a lot of blowouts here, and it gives oh. the body they want. It doesn't feel sticky, it doesn't feel weird, and it just does what it says it's going to do. Um, that product's incredible. I don't mean to necessarily just plug that one, but (laughs) there's a lot of really great ones. But if I think about everything I've used in my career for what it does, it's probably my top favorite product. Well, and, and like you were kind of mentioning, like, you know, it really, it really depends. Like when we, when we talk with a a blonde client here, Mm -hmm. you know, we deal with hot and dry Mm -hmm. California and Hawaii deal with hot and humid. Yeah. You know, so, and you know, that, that moisture gets inside of a, a thin haired client and that hair Mm -hmm. falls flat. So now you've got to, you've got to find, you know, you sit in your chair clients and you tell Mm -hmm. your stylist, this is, this is the struggle that I'm having. They're going to have products that are going to offset that. So when you step out in a humid Mm -hmm. place, but Mm -hmm. when you're dry, you know, those, those, those thin haired clients, their hair becomes a way more brittle and they've got to have those light moisture, um, moisture products in their hair yeah. to kind of give it that body. So it's just super, super interesting and super hard how different it is. And that's, that's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, I mean, what differences did you notice between, I mean, obviously the ethnicity part from a Hawaii, California versus Arizona, but like, you know, how hair reacted differently in haircuts and, and, uh, times of the year. Like, can you speak well, on that a little bit? Haircuts, they, they should be pretty, basically the same. I mean, you, you learn the foundation, you modify for each client. It's about the finishing. So blow drying, which is where, or styling, which is where products come into play. I mean, these manufacturers don't spend all this time, uh, coming up with this new product just because they want to have fun with it. They are doing it for a reason. There's a market demand for it. And it's important for clients to hear that. Now, the biggest difference that I noticed between, uh, we'll put together Hawaii and Arizona where product is used all the time on everybody versus California. California, you come here and you get a client sits down to do your first style blow dry on at your new salon in 2014 and you go to put some heat protectant on and she about loses it because there's uh, in the Bay Area, more specifically the Palo Alto um, area, there is this thing where they just don't want product in their hair. And they feel, they say that it feels like it's dirty or it has stuff on it. So what that tells me is they're not using the right product, number one, or yes. um, the one that's best for their hair, or the stylist or the technician is using too much or too little. Yes. So are not getting the result that the product's designed for. So I always say to clients, and this is important because it's actually going to save their hair, make their hair better. You wouldn't leave your house without sunscreen on your face. So why would you leave without putting product in your hair? No, and that and the the sun, you know, especially those three states have a lot, mm-hmm. a lot of sun. Mm-hmm. And if you're not putting any sort of UV in there, and you're a, a blonde mm-hmm. or any other color like that, the sun is going to fade that color out a lot faster. Yeah, yeah. I try to encourage that that a little bit though, because it kind of helps bring out some of these looks that we have these days, these new looks. Um, I don't mind if sun gets to it a little bit. I don't like the dryness or the damage that it can cause, but the lightness sure. and the brightness, it's fun to see that natural uh, look and natural tone come up. That's true. I can, I can, I can see that. I can see that. Uh, uh, which state, which state did you like doing hair in the most? I'm going to say that I have, I don't have a favorite. Um, <laughs> there are things about each place that make it a little more interesting or not interesting. Um, 
Uh, I mean, I would assume that you loved living in Hawaii, you know, having interacted yeah. with you, you loved living in Hawaii better. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Hawaii is amazing. It's an amazing place. I mean, you're just happier there and everybody's kind of like the Aloha spirit is running all over the place. And it's like, Oh, you're going to be 20 minutes late. No big deal. We'll see you when you get here. Aloha. Yeah. See you later. You know, it's, it's a little more relaxed than coming to Arizona where everybody has to be on time for everything. Yep. Yep. And in California, if the stylist isn't on time, then that's a problem. But if the client isn't, then it's not a big deal. And, and and that's a very general statement for me to make, a very broad statement for me to make. But that's kind of like how it goes. You know, um, uh, each place has its own feel, its own energy, its own kind of um, thing about it that makes it unique. And I am grateful that I've worked in all these places because I think it helps make me a more well-rounded uh, stylist and able to adapt to different environments. For sure, quickly. for sure. And I can share that information with somebody. I can help them. I had a friend, uh, one of my clients in Arizona, who's now just kind of a friend because I don't do her anymore. Her stylist in Nebraska was moving to New York. And Amy asked me to talk to her and tell her some stuff or give her some ideas because I have moved around a bunch. And she was so grateful that I did that for her. And the stylist was grateful. Now, this kid is going to be a rock star. She's amazing. And that I could give her just a little bit of information about moving from here to there, as well as some other things that are going on in our industry. Um, she was able to make some choices that are going to give her a long-term work home, if you will. And she's thrilled. And I told her about things she didn't know as far as becoming an employee somewhere. So it was, um, I'm not doing that because it makes me feel better. It makes me feel better because I'm able to share that information with her. I'm able yes. to get back. And, um, I love doing that. Um, uh, it's, a. Uh, it's a it's a strange place out there sometimes when you're looking for a job. This is what I'll tell you is the biggest difference for me. In Hawaii, no problem finding a job. In, in Arizona, no problem finding a job. California, it was a little bit more difficult. And um, one person brought up my age and said, why are you <laughs> over in a new city? Um, but it was just a little bit, um, it, was a, it was more challenging, if you will. Yeah. The salon I'm at now, uh, they found me. And that was really cool to experience because you pound the pavement to try and find a place. And with all these modern things that we have going on, like Indeed, um, Glassdoor, uh, LinkedIn. Also, it's very important. Any stylist out there does, that does not have a LinkedIn page, you need to do one now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, because that's the wave of the future. And uh, the, sli the salon I'm at now, they found me on Indeed. They found my uh, resume there and they called me up. And uh, I've been working there ever since. And, um, that was kind of cool. I didn't have to go out and look for it. They looked for me. That's what this, that's where we're going. That's where this industry is going. It's going to be moving there. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and, and I tell, and I tell clients all the time, I'm like, look, uh, if you are researching, uh, for a, for a new stylist or whatever, and either the salon or the stylist themselves mm -hmm. don't have an online presence anywhere, like you have a hard time finding them. I'm like, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't roll the dice. Yeah. You know? I yeah. mean, unless you know, unless you know somebody super, super well, like, right. and, and they give you the referral, but I'm like, look, it's 2018. If they're not anywhere online, like if you can't go on their Instagram page and at least see mm -hmm. some of their work, you know, mm -hmm. whether you're posting every day or just posting haircuts, you know, every so often or colors or whatever, like you could do it as little as you want, but if you're not there and they can't see your work, I'm like, mm -hmm. just don't, just don't roll the dice. Right. You know, like, right. Go to somebody who's somewhere online. So right. just really, right. really important. And it is a lot about, you know, um, getting your name out there, getting yourself known, um, having people talk about you, the buzz. And um, uh, uh, because people still talk regardless. I mean, the, the statistic is something like uh, if you have a good experience with a stylist or at a restaurant or something, that person is going to tell one person. Right. Yeah. If they have a bad experience, they're going to tell 10. Yeah. So, and that's just the way it is. Um, so one thing we do here is we ask for people to um, like our Instagram, like our Facebook page, like our, you know, the salon. We use Begaro Pro and uh, they can do a lot on there as far as writing reviews and stuff like that. Yeah. I myself uh, try to write only positive reviews <laughs> because. <laughs> The thing about, you know, like a bad day at a restaurant, for example, the server may be getting your food to you 45 minutes after you sat down while the other tables got theirs from the same server sooner. But here's the thing. We're all human beings. 
And sometimes people just don't really care about their job. But yeah. who knows what is actually going on with that person? What if they found out that their mom died or there was going to die or their dad had cancer or their dog died the morning, you know, or their son. Or what you know. if they saved your butt, like something happened in the kitchen yep. and your food fell on yep. the ground. Now, yep. now that person should have come out and been like, hey, this is what happened and this is what we're going to do. But they could have been saving like, hey, you know, get this food ahead of everybody else's because it fell or, or whatever the case may be. Yeah. No, you, you're right. You just never know what's happened. And I think a, a more Hawaiian approach as a client and a stylist is just to, you know, you know, just it, it's, it's okay. And you know, if it's habitual, then there's an issue, but like, you know, one, one day you've been going here, you know, you've been going to the place forever, or even if you're a new client and they're a little bit behind, if they communicate mm -hmm. well, if they, mm -hmm. if they uh, apologize, if they do something proactively to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of sweeten the deal to kind of rectify the issue, then it's like, you found a, a great place of people who are going to take care of you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's important to take into consideration. Because you just don't know. We're all humans. We all have things that happen. And it's not on purpose, usually. Um, it is sometimes. It does happen. But, um, you know, I, I love my industry because I think it's taught me some of that stuff. I've had to learn it along the way. And probably the hardest thing for me to learn as a stylist uh, in this industry is that I cannot make everybody happy. I really can't. Yes. I'm not a magician, and I'm not going to get along with everybody. <laughs> so... And, and I think clients also kind of sometimes don't realize that or they don't they don't know that. They think that, you know, we work at this salon, so we must be really good. And, well, it might be really good, but yeah. we're not going to get along. And True. you're not going to like my technique or the fact that I want to go with the manufacturer's processing time versus putting you under a dryer and blasting your hair to death. Um, uh, <laughs> so those are some of the things that I think are really important moving forward with, you know, a, a client stylist relationship. And um, I love what Hairdo's doing because they are creating that. They have created that team approach, and and each though every even though everybody has their own thing to offer, it can be consistent in the sense that they're going to get a similar or a um, a good service regardless. And and that's just cool. I love that idea. Um, it's something that's been absent from the industry for a very long time. Yeah, and I think it's I th I feel like it's try at least salons as a whole are trying to bring that back cuz you now cuz now mm -hmm. you've got like a division basically and we we're, we're not going to go deep into this cuz this right. is not going to be what clients are going to want to listen to but you know there's there's starting this division where it's like stylists either want to work by themselves or huh. be in a be in a salon environment. Right. And, right. You know, and so it's like you either want to be by yourself and you know from my take I'm like all the techniques that are coming out and all the stuff that we do to hair and how hair is evolving from a color standpoint. It's like, if you don't have somebody there to help back up, like you are on an Island, if you mm -hmm. are by yourself, like, and, and if you're, if you're so invested in yourself that you put the money in to educate multiple times mm -hmm. and stuff, then, then cool. But I, I'm seeing more people not invest in themselves, just want to be working alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I know all the stylists here and there's some really talented ones here who are like, I love having a second person in my consultation to figure out, you know, what, you know, to make the best decision or that I can suggest somebody out and trust that that maybe they won't, you know, maybe my client won't connect personally with that person very well, but I know that they're going to get a good service and they'll, they'll be yeah. back with, you know, they'll be, they'll be back with me if they make sure they pre book or, you know, uh, yeah. you know, I'm off of vacation or I'm done being sick or whatever. So yeah. I think it's just as a mindset that, that clients and stylists should be adapting a little bit more because it'll just make it a more harmonious experience yep. for everybody involved. And to touch on that client, the, the clients, they, they may not understand why the, another stylist is being brought over for a consultation. For example, it's teamwork. It's oh, yeah. two heads are better than one sometimes. Oh, for sure. And it's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean there's something wrong or the stylist is incapable of doing the service. They're just looking for another point of view which is incredible. Yeah. Well, if I was a client, I would almost like, if I'm hearing this, I would almost demand the next time that I came in and I wanted a little change to my color. I'd be like, Hey, could yeah. you grab another side? Like I would almost like, I should expect that because I'm like, I, I want everything that you have that the salon has to offer. And I want a few extra people looking at it. Not that I don't trust yeah. you and that the stylist doesn't trust themselves, but I'm like, it just makes things better. And you know, there are people who are liars out there. So, yeah. you know, you have one stylist at the chair and the client saying one thing, then calls into the front desk and says, she didn't give me what she, what I wanted. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I can, you know, as the manager or as a front desk person, I can go over to the side and be like, hey, this person said this. Well, if there's another stylist that was in on the consultation, both of them saying, no, yeah. that's not what she said. We did exactly what she wanted. And then it's like I come back and be like, look, we had two stylists in on there. Like, yeah, you're trying to either get a free service or just complaining for whatever reason. Yeah. So, no, it's an odd concept for everybody to grasp onto. I had to do it. Um, what was it? Uh, not yesterday, the day before I was doing a perm on somebody. I had had a consultation with her via FaceTime, so I didn't really see her hair or touch it. By the time she got to the salon, it was a little questionable for me to do the service. So nice. I had our creative director go over and get his opinion on it. And the opinion was to go ahead and proceed with the service, but add this other thing to it that was going to be basically our insurance policy. Right. So everybody got what they wanted. I did the service. I got paid for it. The client got the, her hair the way she wanted to. Um, it showed us that the creative director was able to come over and stand next to a master stylist and we could have this conversation. And it actually kind of makes us look like we know what we're doing a little bit more because, yes. you know, um, it's just a cool thing and it, it's cultivating uh, an experience. And and the salon I'm at now, which is Edge Hair Salon in Palo Alto on University, it is an amazing place. We have a really good group of um, stylists. Um, we, there's some struggles we're going through and we're figuring that out. But the coolest thing is at our last staff meeting, everybody sat there and said, we want to be a team, we want to be the core, and we want to create something. And that's incredible to hear yes. because I didn't expect to hear that from these people. And I was so happy when I did. Yeah. And now it's and now it's actually putting putting that into work. And that's where yeah. that's where it takes takes some effort. Hey, Justin, I really I really appreciate you coming on. Uh, do you want to plug any social media that you spend the most time on? Um, Instagram, Justin K. M. Powell. And um, uh, that's where you can find me. Um, I'm not the greatest at posting my work because I'm a little bit older than everybody else, but I do it as often as I can. <laughs> So. You got some work on there, and that's why I said, yeah. you know, there's if you can't find really much on there, or it's been four years since there's been a haircut put on there, I'm like, probably, you know, just you know, tread tread carefully. Yeah, that's a problem. Now, I did post something recently. I don't know exactly when it was, but it was I had an assistant at a salon in Arizona for a long time, and I did her color for many years, and I had all these pictures of her, and I got I grabbed some from her Facebook page, and I created this little post about. This is Jesse's hair over the years. I was responsible for it. And this is how cool it is. It, evol- it was an evolution. And so having social media outlets is really big. It's really cool. Because um, you do get a lot of uh, traffic that way. I have people around the world that are liking my stuff that I never thought would. Yeah. Like actually famous people. I'm like, how do they find little old me? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, it's but it, it's important. Um, no, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, but just Instagram, Justin K. M. Powell. If you want to know my the reason behind the name, I will explain it later. <laughs> all right. Well, hey, thank you so much, Justin. And uh, thank you all for taking some time to listen to this. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or wanted anything that would be um, – added to this or, or to an interview or things that you would like to know, whether you're a stylist or a client, just let us know, uh, comment, uh, wherever you're finding the podcast, uh, rate the podcast if you'd like to, so I can do, uh, do more interviews like this with maybe Justin again or other stylists, uh, and salon owners. If you are a salon owner or stylist in another state, I would love to hear from you and love to connect with you. All right. Uh, Justin, have a great day. Thanks for taking some time. Thank you, Paulson. Enjoy your day. Yeah, you too.